Part Four of I Was a Teenage Secret Weapon by Richard Sabia. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part Four. Plekoskaya took a sip of wine. There is obviously some kind of uh, political readjustment going on within the government, and the unpleasant thing about these little uh, disturbances is that one can never be certain who will emerge to inform the people that he is their unanimous choice for leader. So don't be in so much of a hurry to rush off to Moscow to commit yourself. You might pick the wrong one. Kodorovich shrugged and sat down at the table. Perhaps you are right. Do you have any idea who is involved this time? <laughs> who isn't involved? Plekoskaya snorted. You and I know, as sensible men must, that in our milieu there are at any given moment thousands of intrigues and plots and counterplots simmering away in the party halls, the ministries, the barracks, and anywhere else you care to look. Of course it is treason, don't misunderstand, General, but most of it is really quite harmless. It is the national pastime of the power elite, a sort of political mahjong, and most of these little bubbling kettles cool and sour from inaction. However, this time it is evident that some drastic catalyst has caused a most violent reaction of these subversive ingredients, and the incredible one-in-a-million possibility has occurred. All the pots are suddenly, all at once, boiling over, erupting into action. By the way, Plekoskaya continued with a smile, you might be interested to know that when I reach Moscow, I am supposed to relieve you of command of the 71st and place you under arrest for unsocialistic activities. Kodorovich, looking dazed, took a glass of wine. Who signed your orders? Major Alim Chavosky of the MVD. Kodorovich smiled for the first time since they had met under the trees. I have orders for your arrest also to take effect when we reach Moscow. Signed by Major Kamashev, M.V.D. I'm sorry, Plekoskaya said, but you will have to wait your turn. The commanders of the 116th and the 48th are both ahead of you. Kudorovich suddenly stood up, frowning, and stared around at the fields where the peasants were working. I don't like the way those people keep glancing at the troops and snickering. I can hear some of their remarks. Don't trouble yourself about it. They've been doing it all morning. It's only good-natured jesting. It breeds disrespect of the army, and disrespect of authority is the first step on the road to anarchy, Kodorovich said severely. Well, at least there's a movement to somewhere, Plekoskaya said. Can you blame them for smiling? That's the 124th, the famous Lightning Division, that's been glued to the road in front of them for the past six hours. In that time it has moved perhaps a hundred or so feet, and I suspect it is only because your 71st is very ill-manneredly pushing from behind. I still don't like their smirking. Plekoskaya suddenly became solemn. It is when they began to laugh openly that we should become concerned. How did you get the American lieutenant out of Moscow? Colonel Peng's superior was asking him. Bushmilov was conducting the interrogation, Colonel Peng replied, when suddenly somebody started shooting through the window from another office across the way. I heard Bushmilov yell something about plotters and counter-revolutionaries, and he and his men started shooting back. Within minutes the entire building was like a battlefield. In the confusion we snatched the American and hustled him away. The corridors were full of groups of MVD men running and shooting, and I have no idea what it was all about. But whatever it was didn't affect us, for we were allowed to pass unmolested. We managed to escape stray bullets and get out of the building with whole skins to our embassy. Getting out of Moscow was the real problem. Within hours the city was clogged with troops. 
Slowly, as supplies were choked off by the congestion, offices and factories and shops closed down, and the people were on the streets strolling about as if on holiday, laughing and joking about the tangle of tanks and vehicles and military equipment that was effectively strangling the city. It appears that not even the highest officers and officials were making any effort to clear up the mess. Each one seemed to be afraid to take any responsibility beyond the last coherent orders that had brought practically the entire army converging on Moscow. We tried to get out by air, but that proved impossible. All civil flights were cancelled, so that the fields could accommodate the armadas of military aircraft that swarmed into the area. We couldn't even get a wireless message out because of the spreading chaos. We had to proceed out of the city on foot, and by then affairs were beginning to take an ugly turn. Food supplies were becoming exhausted, and as long as the military refused to budge, nothing could be brought in, even their own supplies. Once out of the city we took to the river, no one attempted to stop us, but neither did any official attempt to help their Chinese comrades. The curious paralysis had spread. It was as if the entire countryside was holding its breath, waiting for some positive sign of authority. In Gorky, where there was less air congestion, we managed to steal a plane and flew it to Finland. The rest you know. Ping's superior nodded. Our Russian friends are losing their grip. That is because they do not practice pure communism. Upon China now falls the mantle of leadership of the People's Republics, as we knew long before it was destined to be. He rose from behind his desk. Come, let us now turn our attention to this strange American lieutenant and see how the interrogation is proceeding. As Ping and his chief stepped into the hallway, they heard a shattering of glass and a cry of pain from the room at the far end of the hallway. It sounds like someone falling through a window, Ping exclaimed. His chief's face was shadowed with a momentary irritation. If that is another one of my men having a foolish accident. What do you mean? Ping inquired. Mean? His chief repeated in exasperation. I'll tell you what I mean. Since this interrogation started, four of my men have injured themselves in silly, stupid accidents. Like the captain who fell off his chair and broke his leg. If I didn't know my men, I would swear they had all been drinking. There was a sudden, single shot. They hurried along the hall, but before they could reach the room at the end, they had to drop to the floor to escape the fusillade of bullets that wind down the corridor. In the great operations room of the Pentagon, the uppermost echelons of the American general staff glared at Dr. Titus, whose civilian presence was defiling this military holy of holies. An admiral sitting next to General Fife banged his fist on the table and almost shouted at Titus, So you're one of the idiots who's been advising the President not to let us commit our forces in Afghanistan. Do you realize the Russians will— Titus appealed to the chairman of the general staff. Do I or do I not have the floor? Hmm? Reluctantly, the chairman restored order and motioned Titus to continue. It is true that the president has been persuaded to not commit the United States to any further military adventures until we have given a plan of mine some little time to take effect. Gentlemen, we have an operation, a secret weapon, that, if all goes well, will make any future military undertakings unnecessary, and bring about the destruction of our enemies. At the mention of secret weapon, the entire general staff, excepting Fife, creaked forward in their seats with eager interest. The secret weapon is an eighteen-year-old boy named Dolliver Wims, recently commissioned a lieutenant in the army, and now in Russian hands. 
An avalanche of derisive remarks concerning his sanity roared down on Titus, but he ignored them and continued. Wims came to work for us last spring, and nothing in his manner or appearance indicated that he was in any way unusual. However, he had hardly been with us a month before complaints from my staff started flooding my office. Our accident rate soared skyward, and all staff fingers pointed at whims. I investigated and discovered that in spite of the accusations, whims was never directly involved in these mishaps. He was present when they occurred, yes, but he never pushed or bumped anyone or dropped anything or even fingered anything he wasn't supposed to. And yet, in the face of this fact, almost everyone, including my most dispassionate researchers, invariably blamed whims. Finding this extremely odd, I kept the boy on, and under various subterfuges I probed, tested, and observed him without his knowledge. Then one day I became annoyed with him, without just cause, I must admit, merely because I was not getting any positive results, and I handled him rather roughly. Within seconds I sliced open a finger. My irritation mounted, and later I went to shove him rudely aside, and down I went, giving my head a nasty crack on the edge of a lab bench. I felt wonderful as I sat in pain on the floor, sopping the blood out of my eyes. With the blow, an idea had come to me, and I felt I at last knew what Wims was, and the factor that triggered his dangerous potential. For weeks afterward, under carefully controlled conditions, I was as nasty to him as I dared be. It took my most delicate judgment to avoid fatal injury, but I managed to document the world's first known accident-prone inducer. I call him Homo causacatere, the fall causer, whose activator is hostility. We have always had the accident-prone, the person who has a psychological proclivity for having more than his share of mishaps. Wims is an individual who can make an accident-prone of anyone who threatens his well-being and survival. This boy, who, as indicated by the tests, hasn't an unkind thought for any creature on this planet, has an unconscious, reactive, invulnerable defense against persons who exhibit even the slightest hostility toward him. The energies of their own hostility are turned against them. The greater the hostility, the more accidents they have, and the more serious they become. And the increase in accidents gives rise to an increase in hostility, and so it goes in an ever-widening circle of dislocation and destruction. As a scientist, I would have preferred to take the many months, perhaps years, necessary to investigate this phenomenon thoroughly. However, these are critical times, and I was possessed with an inspired idea of how we might utilize this phenomenon against the enemies of the free world. Through a colleague on the Scientific Advisory Council, I got the President's ear, and he decided to let us try, on the basis I'm certain, that the best way to handle screwball scientists is to allow them one or two harmless, inexpensive insanities in the hope that they will make an error and discover something useful. Through the good offices of General Fife, who was appraised of our plan, Wims was snatched into the army, commissioned, and sent to Burma to be captured. Intelligence advises that he has been taken to Moscow, which is, for him, an American officer ostensibly on a secret mission, the most hostile environment extant. Titus shook his head. I suppose I should feel sorry for those poor Russians. They don't have a chance. Sorry for them, Fife blustered. Think what I've had to go through. Those ridiculous orders couldn't explain to anyone. All my people think I've lost my mind. Felt like a fool given that idiot a battlefield commission during a training exercise. It was necessary to give him some rank, Titus explained. 
The communists wouldn't expect a private to be sent on a secret mission. They just wouldn't bother to interrogate him. Now an officer whose return was specially requested the day following his capture would seize their attention, and surely they would apply their nasty pressures to find out why. He hasn't been returned through the regular monthly exchange, and they even deny having captured him, which seems to indicate that the plan is working. An admiral stirred and shifted under his crust of gold. How long have they had him? Six weeks. And nothing's happened yet, the admiral commented. My guess is that we could sit here for six years, and nothing would come of such a barnacle-brained scheme. An Air Force general spoke up in the breezy jargon of the youngest service. I'm with the old man from the sea on this one, he said as the admiral winced. I just don't see spending billions for alphabet bombs, and then warming our tails on them, while the psycho nosies move in and try to fight these sandlot wars with voodoo and all that jazz. An aide hurried in from the adjoining message center and handed the chairman a paper. Everyone waited in silence while the chairman seemed to take an unusually long time to read it. Finally, he looked up and said, This is a special relay from the president's office, and since it concerns us all, I'll read it aloud. He held the paper up and read, Apropos of your present conference with Dr. Titus, it may please the general staff to learn that the Russian Communist Party newspaper, Pravda, has just denounced the newspaper of the Red Army, Isvestia, as a tool of the decadent, warmongering, capitalistic ruling circles of the imperialistic Western bloc. Other evidence of severe internal upheaval of a nature favorable to the West is pouring in through news channels and being confirmed by state and CIA sources. Congratulations, Dr. Titus. Dr. Titus arose with unconcealed triumph. Gentlemen, apparently my hypothesis is correct. The disintegration that will crumble our enemies has already begun. Our secret weapon is a stunning success. The crusted admiral looked sourly at Titus. Of course you're only assuming that this whims person is responsible. We'll never know. Why won't we? Titus demanded. You speak of him as if he were dead or doomed. And I tell you, he is no such thing. Don't you understand? He cannot be harmed. And when he gets back here, and he will, he'll tell you himself exactly what and how it happened. The aide rushed in with another message. Again from the President, he announced. It has been confirmed by CIA, he began reading aloud, that two weeks ago a group of Chinese officials in a Russian aircraft landed at a Finnish airfield. It is now known definitely that an ostensibly ill member of their group, who was put aboard their plane in a stretcher, was in reality a young American officer. Among other things, this explains the eighteen contradictory five-year plans announced by Peking this week. CIA says they are going the way of the Russians. Again, congratulations, Dr. Titus. Well, General Fife, Titus said, smiling at him, perhaps you now feel somewhat differently about this whims business, hmm? Fife roared, unable to contain himself any longer. Do you really believe that rot you've been feeding us? You have the audacity to credit yourself with a downfall of two powerful nations, even if it does happen? You think your insane ditherings about an incompetent half-wit has anything to do with anything? You may have bamboozled the President. After all, he's only a civilian. But you're not about to fool me. These are perilous times and I have no use for you professors and your crazy, useless theories. Now why don't you get out of here and let us do our job, trying to keep this planet from blowing up in our faces? For the first time in his life, 
Dr. Titus flew into an unreasoning fury. How could this fat, uniformed mountain of stupidity still contrive to deny the facts and dare to speak to him the way he did? After what he had just accomplished, his rage boiled over, and Titus rushed at Fife, his fist already striking ahead. He never touched the general. Unaccountably, he got tangled in his own legs and fell heavily to the floor. When he tried to rise, hot pain burned in his ankle. He sat there, staring up in astonishment at Fife hulking over him. It had happened so swiftly no one had yet spoken or moved. You! Titus screeched incredulously, pointing directly at Fife. <laughs> you! You of all people! And Titus sat there on the floor, rubbing his injured ankle, and he laughed and laughed, till the tears came. End of I Was a Teenage Secret Weapon by Richard Sibia. This story recorded by Phil Chenevere.